uh, it's a lovely day for us to gather together and talk about our, our new exhibit at the MSU Museum. And uh, I will just announce now that the session will be recorded, um, but I'll go ahead and get started with our introduction and then um, we'll just see what happens today. We've had some wonderful uh, sessions um, in the past, so I'm sure it will be great today as well. Uh, in today's talk, uh, curator Dr. Julian Chambliss will discuss the new virtual exhibition at the MSU Museum called Beyond the Black Panther, Visions of Afrofuturism in American Comics. The exhibition is open now on our website and you can go to that. I, let me go ahead and put that in the chat. We have three ways that you can experience the exhibition there. So when you go, make sure that you check to see what um, experience would work best for you. And there's the web address in the chat. So we look forward to having you visit our site and see the exhibition and give us feedback if you'd like. Dr. Julian C. Chambliss is the Val Berryman Curator of History at the MSU Museum and Professor of English with a joint appointment in history at MSU. In addition, he is a core participant in the MSU College of Arts and Letters, CEDAR, the Consortium for Critical Diversity and a Digital Age Research. His research interests focus on race, identity, and power in real and imagined urban spaces. As an interdisciplinary scholar, he has designed museum exhibitions, curated art shows, and created public digital history projects that trace community identity and power in the American South. Dr. Chambliss will take questions at the end of the presentation today. So please uh, hold on to those and you can use the Q&A function or the chat. So thanks so much, Dr. Chambliss. All right, well, thanks for uh, coming out today or coming in today. I know the Zoom always throws me off. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, talk a little bit about um, Afrofuturism. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, as a, a series of conversations about the exhibit, uh, I've chosen to try to approach this around the idea of sort of delving into the themes of the exhibit and, and some of the foundation associated with the work. And it is uh, Women's History Month. So today I'm going to talk specifically about sort of intersectional, intersectionality and the, the, the divine feminine as it relates to Afrofuturism and how that sort of plays out in the theme of the exhibit. So the image on your screen is actually from one of the artists in in the show, Tim Fielder, who is, um, of course, uh, recently released a graphic novel called Infinitum, an Afrofuturist tale. But he, like uh, many, many, many uh, artists and scholars, is a huge fan of Zoyna Hurston. And this is a poster he created related to Zoyna Hurston. That's the image on the screen. This is so it's not exactly a comic image that's in the show, but related to an artist that's in the show. As Denise uh, indicated, uh, Beyond the Black Panther is, is currently available and we, we've done our, our most to provide as many different avenues as possible uh, for people to explore. And I always like to show the great graphics by Kelly Hansen, who is a, a designer of our exhibit and all the great work that she did, um, really referencing, but at the same time, remixing and putting our own spin on the sort of aesthetic language of Marvel's Black Panther, which sort of inspired the, the jumping off point for this exhibit. So um, because I'm talking about uh, this sort of theme of uh, intersectionality or Black feminism and Afrofuturism, I wanna start out with some art. Um, this is an image called Mother Box by Black Kirby, which is actually an artistic duo that is John Jennings and Stacey Robinson. These are two artists that are in fact in the show. <laughs> Once again, not exactly an image in the show, but people connected to the show. Mother Box is part of a series of work that Black Kirby does that's inspired by 1960s Silver Age uh, comics from Marvel. So this is Jack Kirby's fourth world work if you're a comic book fan. And Mother Box in that original work is a Sentinel computer that looks like a box. 
Mother Box and Black Kirby's work, however, I think captures many of the elements that are so important to understanding Afrofuturism in particular. You can see here a female form, uh, the color aesthetic here, I think is very evocative of Afrofuturism. Also this sort of merger of the technological and biological, this sort of cyborg, uh, aesthetic that's so important to that original definition of Afrofuturism, but it's all sort of captured in the idea of, of a Black woman holding the earth, right, the mother, the mother bonds. So when you look at an image like this, I, I think it's easy for us to go, oh, that looks very Afrofuturistic. <laughs> it's, like, it's very Afrofuturistic. Comic booky, she's got like an arm that's not really an arm. She's, she's holding the earth. There's like cosmic stuff in the picture when I show this to students, they are like, oh yeah, this is super Afrofuturist. But the link between feminism and Afrofuturism is visible on multiple levels. And, and one of the things that if you really think about, really look at the, the 20th century, there have been a lot of female figures that are encapsulated in the Afrofuturist canon, often in music and entertainment that capture this. So Grace Jones in her work or LaBelle, uh, which was an early, uh, a group from the 1970s featuring Pat and Bell um, that has, has a great song that, that people often associate with Afrofuturism. Of course, Janelle Monet is often regarded by contemporary scholars and, and creators as a very Afrofuturist figure. So this idea that women are Afrofuturist and like that women have sort of articulated Afrofuturist dialogue is actually quite easy to see, even though when we talk about Afrofuturism, we often have starting points that are very, very male. When you think about a character like Sun Ra, or you think about a writer um, like Samuel, Samuel Delaney, but at the same time, there are always these female figures that fit very, very neatly or very prominent in sort of formulating and, and shaping Afrofuturism. So what, what does a sort of voice of, of female Afrofuturist um, tell us about Afrofuturism, why it's important from a sort of feminist perspective. Um, I like to point out that we, we have interviewed some, some Afrofuturist women writers and create, uh, creatives in the Voices of the Black Imaginary, which is a, a collection at the Vincent Force Library that I'm working on. And one of the people that we talked to is Ingrid Lafleur, who came to MSU and gave a great talk, sort of outlining her, uh, her vision of Afrofuturism and her experience with Afrofuturism. And she says, as a one, I've had a unique, almost desperate relationship to the idea of utopia, that it could be established and it could be served, um, could serve good for all, right? So I think one of the things about Afrofuturism, especially in the context of women, is that there is a, an element here of, of Black women's traditional emphasis on helping the community, helping their sons, their daughters, uh, helping their mate, their, their parents, their helping and protecting, right? These are very much established ideas. So in that context, um, one thing we often think about is Afrofuturism is about change, but I wanna emphasize that I think there's a legacy of Afrofuturism on the part of um, sort of black activism by women that really fits into a, a broad sort of social political tradition that's very important, right? And remember, as I, you've seen in my previous talk, I often point to Kojo Oshun and his further considerations of Afrofuturism as something that's really sort of inspiring a lot of my thinking. And this sort of recovering of histories of kind of futures and the creation, you know, he talked about Afrofuturism as a project to create a space with, where, where critical works and tools are, are created for interventions and established patterns of oppression and isolation and destruction associated with sort of like uh, colonial imperialist society, right? So Afrofuturism is dedicated to this sort of recovery project, but it's also very much dedicated to a, like a counter futures, right? A new future project, right? And this, again, I like to think, you know, what is the difference between this contemporary social, political, economic moment, uh, cultural moment for black artists and activism? How does it differ from say, the Harlem Renaissance or how this is different from the Black arts movement. I think within the DNA of Afrofuturism is a sense of reordering society 
and creating a different future. There is a break inherent in the structure of Afrofuturism. There's a break inherent in the structure of Afrofuturism. And the nature of that break is at some level very much dependent on a black female ideology, a black feminist ideology, right? And so intersectionality is inherent to this sort of structure of Afrofuturism. And I think this is something that we can see if we but look at it. Again, there are plenty of smarter, stronger, faster thinkers than myself well, like, <laughs> that think about this. Robin D.G. Cowley's great book, Freedom Dreams, um, is, is a really important text that I often you know, get students to, to read excerpts from when I'm teaching about Afrofuturism, uh, in part because he calls attention to the way that Black women's sort of contribution to the ideological landscape of Black liberation is central and we shouldn't allow it to be written out, that we have to really think about the idea that Black women are actually sort of like thought leaders in the formulation of a kind of freedom infrastructure. And so, again, when we think about critical race theory, you know, these ideas uh, that are so sort of underpinning some of our ideological conversation and current critical critiques of how society operates, uh, again, women are at the forefront of this, at recognizing the nature of he hegemony, hegemonic thought and, and the need for social justice. You just sort of think about current social activism and the key role that Black women play in sort of articulating this is what's necessary for freedom. Again, this is a, a, a new idea. I would argue that this is an old idea, and we could trace that idea through a kind of activism and, and, and action with with clear Afrofuturist ties. So when we look at someone like Pauline Hopkins, who is an early Afrofuturist writer, um, her work, her person and her work represent a kind of counter storytelling in the public form, right? In the early 20th century, like she, very young, very brilliant um, woman writer from Portland, Maine. She, you know, toured the country and wrote plays by the time she was 21 and served as the editor for the Color of American Magazine and, and wrote several novels. And one of which, of course, Of One Blood, The Hidden Self, has a, what, what we, what many Afrofuturist scholars would describe as a proto Wakanda uh, in the story, right? And so when we think about um, the story of One Blood, of a, a, a lead character who discovers that he's a prince from a hidden African kingdom, uh, in Ethiopia that, you know, has never been conquered and so on and so forth. Like it, it reads very much like, like Black Panther in that regard and very much like a Wakanda. And we know that Hopkins is writing at some level to an audience of both African-Americans who she's trying to encourage to think in opposition to the sort of like scientific racism and Jim Crow segregation that is defined in the early 20th century um, and she's also writing to, to create like a kind of counter future context, right? Like there is no reason why you African-Americans should not want to embrace your black heritage. There is greatness there, right? This is a, a sort of like very visible conversation being offered by Hopkins in her work. So, you know, I like to think about this in the context of both these sort of writers, their female writers who are both writing fiction, but also writing nonfiction, right? Like the, in Hopkins' case, she actually writes these novels, but she's the editor of a magazine that is geared towards middle-class readers. So she's writing both fiction and nonfiction. And as you, as I've noted in previous talks, I believe in very much in this idea of like thinking about a black future industry and recovering that black future industry that merges both, both fictive narratives, but also um, projections and, and sort of sociological and social science work that's being created, especially in the early 20th century by Black people as a counter narrative to the sort of scientific racism that is so important to the rise of Jim Crow segregation, right? So when we look at what, what people like Hopkins or someone like Zora Hurston is doing, both with their fictive work and with their nonfiction work, like their, their their scholarship. And Hurston's case, I always like to point out that she is a great scholar, a great interdisciplinary scholar who is writing work deliberately designed 
um, to be like public scholarship trying to rehabilitate in the mind or, or at least create a space in the mind of, of the popular public about the value of blackness in a, in a time where the value of blackness is deliberately being um, devalued by white people as a justification for white supremacy, right? For a justification for Jim Crow segregation. So we should think about Zoya Hurston not as a, a black conservative as she's often labeled in the 20th century, but think about her actually as part of a lineage of Afrofuturist thought actors who are trying to create work that is just transformative. And Hurston is a writer and an anthropologist. She's a, she thinks about metaphysics, right? Her emphasis on hoodoo, her work as a, a sort of public intellectual, a journalist, uh, an SAS. All this is designed to sort of like rehabilitate the idea of blackness, right? She is concerned with recovering traditional black culture and valuing traditional black culture, right? A lot of her oral history work is that. And even our most recent book that came out many years after that, Barracoon, is a very good oral history project where she's tracing in conversations, tracing the experience of African American um, in bondage. Uh, all of these things, I think, call our attention to the nature of um, Black feminist ideology and intersectionality, which is, of course, a concept that is, is, is uh, defined very, very well by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. And this idea that if you can create a world where Black women are safe, then you're creating a world that is both um, working against the sort of matriarchal, but also working against white supremacy, and, and that, in fact, creates a more free world for everyone. So when we look at Afrofuturism as a field, I think one of the things that, that comes to the fore is that Afrofuturism as a, as a pattern of practice tends to elevate women and tends to elevate Black women. This is one of the things that's very important. Yatasha Womack, whose book Afrofuturism is one of the sort of like really accessible texts that I use when I talk to students about this. She says the main commonalities when you think about people like Pauline Hopkins, when you think about people like Zoya Hurston, the main commonalities is that these individuals desire to encourage free thinking in the isms that have plagued the present and the recent past, right? So when we look for an Afrofuturist and we're looking at women, we can see a kind of commonality around this idea that they, they, they seek to disrupt systems of oppression and they seek to create more free spaces. Um, when we think about Afrofuturism as a, a, a landscape of the now, a landscape of, of recent, the recent past, there's no question that one of the defining figures for this is Octavia Butler. And this is very important uh, because Octavia Butler, of course, is uh, a science fiction writer who basically transcends the science fiction genre. And so why is that meaningful? Well, of course, science fiction has been and, and was for many years, um, perhaps continues to be at some level, considered, considered a marginal drama, right? It's not serious fiction, but Butler's work is often considered that. And um, one of the earliest work that sort of captures uh, the, her ability to use the sort of fictive landscape to talk about questions of hierarchy and power and liberation is Kindred. And I wanna, I wanna play you a little bit of a kind of audio book snippet from Kindred if for those of you who might not be familiar with this work. And I'll, and I'll talk a bit more about why this particular work is both indicative of a kind of Afrofuturist ideology, but also somewhat um, not in a way. Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of Kindred by Octavia E. Butler, narrated by Kim Staunton. This book is copyrighted 1979 by Octavia E. Butler. This recording is copyrighted 1998 by Recorded Books. It begins on June 9th, 1976, her 26th birthday. It will be all over by July 4th, the bicentennial anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In those few short weeks, Dana Franklin will see years of history pass before her astonished eyes. And now, Kindred. Prologue. 
I lost an arm on my last trip home. My left arm. And I lost about a year of my life and much of the comfort and security I had not valued until it was gone. When the police released Kevin, he came to the hospital and stayed with me so that I would know I hadn't lost him too. But before he could come to me, I had to convince the police that he did not belong in jail. That took time. The police were shadows who appeared intermittently at my bedside to ask me questions I had to struggle to understand. How did you hurt your arm? They asked. Who hurt you? My attention was captured by the word they used, hurt, as though I'd scratched my arm. Didn't they think I knew it was gone? So that little audio snippet from Kendrick um, lays out the, the intro of the story and those first few, first few paragraphs of the story. Uh, the lead character, Dana, uh, is traveling back and forth in time. So this is a spoiler if you haven't read Kendrick, so cover your ears. Um, and, and the reason she's traveling back and forth in time is that she's mysteriously put in the position to protect the person, the slaveholder who is going to father her, right? And this is a violent set of interactions between the, her future you know, ancestor who's white and setting up at some level the violation of her future ancestor who is his slave so she could be created. So she's put in an almost impossible position. And, and I would argue that part of the reason the story uh, opens with the trauma of a lost arm is because trauma is actually founding a founding element of the American experience. And, and this book takes place during the centennial, right? So there's a, there's a nature of this story that's very, very deliberate and very much about the American experience. And Butler herself what, what is quoted as sort of talking about the desire for her work to be thinking about um, trauma and hierarchy and race, right? All of her, all of her work is about trauma, hierarchy, and, and, and race. Um, not surprisingly, again, John Jennings and Damien Duffy, John Jennings is in the show with his work, and Damien Duffy are in the show with a different work, but they recently produced a graphic novel in, uh, interpretation a translation adaptation of Kindred. If you're a student or, or faculty member at MSU, this is an ebook that you can get from the library. So you can read the, the Kindred graphic novel through our library. Um, and this is the this is actually the, the first scene, a panel, the first scene where Dana travels back in time. Because one of the ways that Kindred is is a science fiction novel is that it is a kind of metaphysical, like it's it's it is, it's, but you're never clear why she's traveling back in time. There's, there's no mechanism explained. That that part isn't 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 ever explained. So it's not really science fictiony. It's more of a, it's more of a metaphysical, almost ghost story. And the traumas that are visioned on her body are real. Like when she comes back, she has experienced beatings. She does lose an arm at the, by the end of the story. So, her her leg her connection to the legacies of trauma around black women and their bodies are very real in, in 1976 while the rest of the country's legacies and traumas around these things are all psychic but she has to deal with them because they're real and there's a question of whether or not we as a country have ever dealt with them because they're psychic right and that should resonate with us today as 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 a set of, of thoughts and actions um Butler's work, I, I cite Butler. I want to talk about Butler and, and point you to, to Butler because that is one of the first women writers to really, you know, in terms of science fiction, she's the first sort of like black female science fiction grandmaster in, in a very real way. But as I say, all of her work very much is about race, is very much about liberation, and very much centers a black female character. So when people think about Afrofuturism, one of the reasons that this sort of black feminist framework is so clear to people is because of Butler, right? So Kindred, The Parable of the Sour, her Patina series, Exogenesis Genesis Trilogy, all these works that you see on, on in this slide, these are works that are foundational to our understanding of, of Afrofuturism as a black 
as a black feminist project, I would argue. And she's a person that if you're interested in like, why do, do we say black feminism is so central to, to, to Afrofuturism? Well, this is why. The character, the sort of like journey of a black female character striving for liberation is very cool. And Powerball of the Sour, which is a, the, the, the second graphic novel adaptation from John Jennings and Damien Duffy of Octavia Butler's work is in the show. Ha, see, I brought it all together. <laughs> uh, another writer that's more contemporary writer is Nalo Hopkins. And again, uh, my goal here is, is to call your attention to these black female writers who are Afrofuturists who, who do resonate in the show. And, and Hopkins herself has recently done comic work, right? So it's not, not as if she's, but her work's not in the show, but I do want to call your attention to her. And here again, there's a little snippet here and I, I always think it's great to hear um, some of these creatives sort of talk about the work and, and, and present it. Um, this one has, this, this is from my, it's an excerpt from my novel, Black Heart Man, which has not yet been published, which does not yet have a publisher. Um, but I have published um, this excerpt, which is the first bit that came to me when I started writing the story. The story is set uh, in a Caribbean island that does not exist. Um, I figure that's plausible deniability because I got a lot of relatives. And uh, <laughs> it's set sort of in the, s uh, between the 16th and the 18th centuries, if I were to identify a century. Uh, and it's set in a community, um, uh, a maroon community. And maronage was the, the practice of escaping uh, um, the plantations and going and setting up um, your own communities, our own communities in, in the bush. In this case, these folks have found um, a deserted island and have made their own community. And this is uh, the story of what happens when the people who think they own them uh, come back to try to reclaim them. I've called it soul case because soul case is a Jamaican term for your body. It's a thing that holds your soul. So Hopkins calls our attention to the, the diasporic nature of Afrofuturist work, even as, as she's also a Black female writer. Uh, I think one of the things about Afrofuturism as a contemporary movement, and it is very much embraced by Afrofuturists, by people who are participating as a diasporic production in the context of the show, we represent this by Greg Emerson Elise, who, who is Annie the Wear Spider is actually drawn from his sort of childhood remembrance of folk tales and folk folk narratives that are associated with his family who is from the Caribbean as well. And so there's a nature of, of a kind of understanding of like the many African peoples who populate the Western hemisphere, their connection to a global blackness that comes through in these sort of speculative works. And Al Hopkins work, Midnight Robbers is a particular uh, very particularly is an Afrofuturist tale. If you if you've read that work, um, the lead characters there are, are on on different planets. There's 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 elements there that are clearly sci-fi, but they're also very much rooted in a kind of like folk understanding of like character and different sort of like personas that are rooted in a black experience. So, you know, both Butler and Hopkins remind us of. Uh, a kind of cultural work that is very sort of central to Afrofuturism and centers, you know, again, Black female characters in Hopkins and Butler's work. But I would note when you think about their work, as, I, as I've noted, when we, to say, when we talk about someone like Pauline Hopkins or you talk about someone like Zordon Hurston, there's a similar kind of uh, consideration of culture personhood, community, and all of this work. And my final example of this is um, um, Tana Ravi Du, I would butcher her name, who's another writer who in, in contemporary landscape is, is another example of a also black female uh, Afrofuturist figure uh, that's very important. Um, and like, there is a video there, hold on here. Okay. I can't help remembering this is uh, January 15th, 
mm-hmm. Martin Luther King Day, when my mother used to let us stay home from school before there was a holiday. My sisters <laughs> and I could stay home from school. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. And um, their activist friends, black and white, would come to the house and they'd play old speeches and records. So the, my parents were really the first storytellers mm-hmm. in my life, those oral narratives about what they did, what their friends did just to make sure that would not be forgotten. So those kinds of stories really spoke to me. Um, The Diary of Anne Frank and Roots by Alex Haley. So I I did little baby stories from the age of four, Mm. but I started to really write when I wrote uh, my little ripoff of Roots (laughs) called Lottie Lottie Make Us Free about a a girl undergoing the middle passage. You know, I was really drawn to try to to explain the inexplicable. How do people survive? And even the horror I write is about that. How do you survive Mm -hmm. against just this insurmountable thing, whether it's a demon or a zombie or a curse or whatever it is? So Dew's work, and I I love that little clip in part because you, you know, again, you get the context of the importance of sort of Black the, the home, the heart as a, a incubator of knowledge, which is a, another one of these elements that we, we can associate with, with Afrofuturism, the centrality of, of, of women sort of maintaining that space of um, providing connection to previous generations or, or communal knowledge or familial knowledge, right? Uh, and, and trauma, right? Like her work is horror work, I think. Uh, and, and very much, as she says, she's about what it takes for Black people to survive, right? Um, all of this is a way to sort of like set up well, well, as I approach this question of like, well, we need to put some stuff in the show <laughs> that's a comics that are going to talk about uh, this sort of black feminist ideology. Um, how, how what, what comics are they? Well, you know, we do have a section here. And as I, as I mentioned, um, Tim Fielder is in the show, not with Infinita, but actually with Maddie's Rocket. And that was very deliberate. I, I knew, I've uh, spoken with Tim. We, we've had him here at MSU uh, numerous times. We, we knew that Infinita was coming out. But part of the reason I wanted to have uh, Maddie's Rocket, images from Maddie's Rocket, which is the graphic novel he did before, right? His sort of first sort of breakthrough graphic novel, not the first work he did, but the sort of breakthrough graphic novel was that the main character is named for Phil's grandmother. And which he, you know, he talked about in interviews, like, you know, I had really strong black maternal figures. Uh, this is in some ways a very all the ages comics. If you've had the chance to, to read Infinitum, you will recognize that it is not an all ages comic. It's a graphic novel. It's a, it's a sort of sci-fi tale more on par with something like uh, Isaac Asimov than it is a kind of all ages story. But Maddie's Rocket is a very accessible, very fantastic sci-fi inspired all ages story, very Buck Rogers uh, sort of pulpy story as you can see from the design aesthetic here. And the sort of spaceport image is, is in the show and it, it sort of really speaks to that. But there's also, because it's the character's name for his grandmother, but the character is also named for Bessie Coleman, who is a pioneering African-American female aviatrix who, like the character in Tim's story, has to go outside the, the parameters of the structure she in to get her flying license. Uh, Betty Col- Bessie Coleman had to go to France to, to get her flying license and then comes back to the United States and becomes a sort of barnstorming Black female pilot, right, in the sort of founding era of uh, aviation, right? So in, in this character, you see both the sort of, you know, the, I think the, the, the basic elements of sort of Black intersectional feminism represented by the character's activity, sort of breaking down barriers, but also a recovery element here because she, she resonates with this sort of forgotten history. Although, you know, from an academic standpoint, no one has forgotten Betty Coleman, but from a public standpoint, remember, our goals with the, the exhibit are to try to create a space for more people to have a greater understanding of the scope, complexity, and um, depth of Afrofuturism, but also the many different kinds of art being produced by African-American artists, very deliberate, deliberately African-American artists that are focused here. And I think Tim Fielder's Matty Rocket um, uh, accomplishes this, that, that goal. Um, I've mentioned, 
them before or numerous times, but the Gibbs sisters, I, I was really taken by their work in part because they're very contemporary um, creators. They have a, a very dynamic um, uh, background, having worked in animation, having worked in, in kids' TV. Uh, and, and like Filder, they were very taken by these sort of like transformative moments of the early 20th century. Those moments where people like Pauline Hopkins and Zornel Hurston are very active and going back to it and imagining a story with a female character as the lead. In their case, the invention of E.J. Whitaker, as I, I, I think I mentioned before, is set at Tuskegee University. And it's important to recognize that Hurston, for instance, is a product of the educational landscape created by a graduate of Tuskegee University because she grew up in Edenville, Florida. The school there, the Hungerford School, was founded by a graduate of Tuskegee University, as were many educational institutions across the South and into the Midwest uh, in that period in the early 20th century. Booker T. Was Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee University graduated a number of educators that went on to create very important regional education hubs that produced African Americans who were educated in a kind of very particular kind of, of Black nationalist education framework, right? Yes, there we often associate these spaces with what, what education scholars might refer to or historians might refer to as an industrial education, but increasingly the scholars of education will talk about these spaces as liberatory spaces, right? That the, there's a liberatory ideology driving the black educator of this period. So it's not surprising, I think at some level that the Gibsons would take to the idea of telling a son of steampunk comic story in the invention of E.J. Whitaker and place it in the context of this sort of, what is a sort of transformative counter public space of the real historical period. So recovering that lost history, but also emphasizing the central role of women as teachers, women as inventors, women as scholars. Again, as we point to people like a Hurston, like a Pauli Hopkins, there's a lot of synergy and synthesis happening in, in this comic, in my opinion. That's why I thought it was a great comic to, in, in, to uh, involve in the show. Um, and then lastly, but definitely not, not least, Ajala, a series of adventures, is is a comic created by two two African American uh, um, creators, but really tapping into a kind of a global black um, uplift ideology again of the early twentieth century. Uh, I'm very much inspired to 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 think about how this work, even though I don't know necessarily that in Stephen Harris or Robert Garrett actually we're reading some of the recent histories by people like Keisha Blaine that calls very particular attention to black nationalist women and their activism in the early 20th century. But that is in fact work that's come out in the last few years that puts a lot of emphasis on the role of women as political thinkers, as theorists, as actors. And this comic with its creation of a, a community service organization that's designed to sort of protect Harlem has been operating since the early 20th century has a female a young female operative who's coming into her own as the basis of the story really captures both that real history, but again, also that fictive tradition of Black um, uh, characters and, and sort of female perspectives around liberation and freedom being so central to how we might think about and, and position um, some of these, these works. So uh, when we think about that, that section in the the show that that section in 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 the exhibit those works are part of a what i hope i try to try to make clear a very long very complicated um intersectional set of thoughts and actions that have inspired afrofuturism and make them worthwhile for those of you who want to know more the the people that i've talked about the the scholars that we talked about the the nature of this work is, is right there. And I hope that you'll take an opportunity to think about this. So I'm gonna stop it there. I think I rambled on long enough, but hopefully um, that um, provided some, some clarity to this idea of how the sort of black feminist ideology is central to uh, our framing of the comics and the landscape and beyond the black pan.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Chambliss. That was great. I, I wasn't sure where you were going to start with that and how the connections were going to be made, but it was just fantastic. And I wrote down several of the books that you referenced. I think it'll be a great way to follow up. Now we'd like to open it up to everyone. If you have questions you'd like to ask, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A function of Zoom, and we'll make sure that your questions get addressed. No questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we do have one in the Q and A. Let me pull this up. Question. Okay, it looks like a question from Johnny, although I'm not seeing the question. So Johnny, if you could please, there it is. Um, do you also study connections with Brazil, for example? Right. So, um, yeah, and there's two answers to that question. One, um, yeah, I'm specifically an Americanist, so I'm like, I have a kind of regional and language barrier. Uh, two, yes, there are a lot of scroll connections to um, South America. The, so the, you know, we could think about this as a liberation project of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, I just don't have the language for all those things. There are some recent comics actually about slave communities in Brazil that have been translated. There's one, Angola Jenga, that's this really massive graphic novel that I have that I keep meaning to have to read, that sort of talks about maroon communities. So like, think about what uh, Mal Hopkins was referencing in her story in that little clip, like the sort of maroon communities and the sort of Jamaican uh, liberatory experience. Like it has, it's important to recognize that a lot of the hemispheric narrative around uh, slavery is about rebellions, right? Mm -hmm. Like there, there are American um, examples like Denmark Bercy and, and things like that of like insurrections where black people take the arms. Uh, eventually we have the civil war, but in the island context, in other, in other parts of the hemisphere, there are very direct um, slave uprisings that overthrow the structure, right? And so um, I don't know all those, those, those comics, but that, that Angola Jenga is one that's come out very recently that is in translation. That's a, a, a good example of that. But um, there, are, there are people on our faculty who have, who, who have studied uh, especially the Brazilian comics, um, Leonora Paul, Leonora Paul, is her last name Paul? But she, mm, I'm worried about, I'm getting the last name wrong, but she has studied this and she is on our, she's in the English department and that's so bad, I'm not sure about her name. I'm going to make sure I get her name. I'll, I'll, I'll have, I'll tweet about this later. Sorry. <laughs> So that's my answer. I'm not, I don't speak the, all the languages. I'm an American and don't hate me. Uh, I've never claimed to be something now I'm not. So I always say I'm an American. So like, that's my limitation. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, oh, yes, someone has put in the chat. Lenora Paula, is that the person you were talking about, Julian? Yes, that's it. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Yep, yep, that's um, it, Lenora Paula. It's Paula, right, yes, Paula. There you go. All right, we have a follow-up question on Johnny's uh, from Thomas, wondering if there have been any important developments in Afrofuturist comics based on works in Europe or in Africa, or, or what's happening in Europe and Africa. You no, know, recently there was a big announcement um, by uh, a studio called um, Unique Studios, Roy Okoyo who has a series of, he has this thing called the Unique Universe. And he just signed a deal with Dark Horse Comics. So Malika, uh, that's one of his comics, which is set in the past. He has a um, Exogenesis, which is a comic, that's sort of like an Iron Man comic. All of it's set in Nigeria. All of it's set in Nigeria. 
and and he's a, 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 a sort of he's he went to school in America, but he set up this little animation slash comic studio called Unique Studios, and he has a unique universe, and he's been very successful uh, in terms of like Kickstarters, but just signed this very big distribution deal with an American publisher called Dark Horse, which if you ever read like the Punisher, not the Punisher, um, Aliens and uh, Predator comics, that's published by Dark Horse. Dark Horse also had the license for Star Wars for a very long time. They're gonna distribute his old work and they're also gonna distribute his new work. So he's an example of very, very, very well put together um, comic book um, independent comic book company that has been very successful and has these African roots. There's a lot of comic activism in places like South Africa. Uh, I was there a couple of years ago uh, and they have a, a variety of different comic types. Some of them are, you know, they have all the genres, a lot of them are political. Um, and, and so it's a hodgepodge. I think there's there's a lot of like uh, web comics that that you can sort of find uh, in Europe, it's a little bit more complicated in the sense that I think, again, uh, the French um, comic culture is very, very vigorous, and they and they do have some some work from creators that that reflect sort of sci-fi um, and diverse cultural themes. Uh, there have been some interesting kickstarters there. But no, nothing leaps to mind immediately. Of course, the internet's gonna be on fire with like, you didn't mention this. I'm like, cause I don't know. So if you <laughs> like, if you if you have something that come to mind, uh, feel free to drop it in the chat. But um, I would say that there's always more stuff out there. And really, actually, one of the huge challenges with some of this work is that there is so much stuff out there. Um, and how do you find it, right? Uh, that's why I put so much emphasis on trying to draw attention to the sort of independent work when we do things like, like this exhibit, right? Like, because much of the distribution and much of the sort of media attention is drawn to these established properties, right? And so this is why we use Black Panther as a jumping off point, but in a lot of ways, the work that we actually see is work that is uh, from independent spaces. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question asking about your background. So would you mind saying a little bit about your, your background? Um, like where was I born, that kind of thing? Uh, it, doesn't <laughs> it doesn't specify, oh, but it means scholarly uh, background. <laughs> yeah, I am, you know, so, uh, actually- <laughs> Not your whole I, life story. Yeah, my whole life story. I was born in a snowstorm. Um, yeah, my background is, uh, of course I have a history, I'm a history person by training. I'm an Americanist and I study uh, basically, you know, post, post-Civil War, post-Reconstruction, urban America, that, that's what I wrote my dissertation on. And I, I switched the comics or I switched the sort of like cultural narratives related to, to urban spaces. Comics were one of them. And, and a lot of my digital work is actually about black spaces. So <laughs> historical spaces like Eatonville. And so um, my, my, my entryway into consideration of Afrofuturism was primarily comics, right? Because of course I write about Black Panther, which is often cited as an Afrofuturist text, Black Panther, Marvel Comics, Black Panther, an early Afrofuturist text. And um, since coming here to MSU, I put a lot of emphasis on trying to marry both digital humanities practice related to comics and um, my sort of like, you know, sort of cultural studies related to Black spaces into a, a sort of cohesive whole. So a lot of the work that I'm doing related to comics and, and to DH, are inflected by questions of like race and space and things like that. Okay, well, apparently I read a little bit too much into that question. Uh, Andrea was wondering, what is the planet in the background of your Zoom screen? <laughs> <laughs> it's Earth at night, right? Like, you, you know, it's a European vision of Earth at night. Okay, so it's not one of the uh, created worlds, uh, okay. No. Um, um, I could do that. I mean, I have like, hold on, hold on, I got one. Hold on, hold on. 
There you go. There. Okay. Wonderful. Wakanda. Um, <laughs> all right. And then we also have a question about April's talk. Will this be on a different theme or will it be similar? What do you plan to do? I will be a different theme. <laughs> so basically okay. I sort of work through different themes with each one of the talks. That's why they're all they're they're kind of different, right? They're all a little bit different. Cause I'm like, oh, I'll talk about this thing. Um, so it'll be a different thing. I probably will be community. Cause I don't think I've done community yet. I don't think I've done community. I, I, I need to so. go look. I need to go look. I no, I don't think I have. I know sometimes it seems like I say the same things, but I really, I'm just, I really, I'm trying to like make sure I hit all the themes. So yeah, we've been a little. I, I think I think you have, and and two, if you've missed some of the the presentations, they're all available on our YouTube channel. You can go and watch the presentations and see the different aspects of the exhibit that Dr. Chambliss has uh, illuminated for us. All right, any other questions? Give people just a second to type here. All right, and then um, if you do have a question, you can go ahead and type it. Um, right now, uh, we do have a poll that we've been doing asking people about your experience here today. If you have just a second to do that before you leave, we'd really appreciate that. Um, our next event is coming up on April 7th. So if you would like to attend, please, uh, make your plans to do that. You can register at the website. Uh, oh, we have one more question from Johnny. Uh, sorry if I missed this. Did you speak on Afrofuturism, African futurism as well? So a question about African futurism. Right. Um, I, I ha have not. Um, I think one of the things about Afrofuturism is that it is a global, uh, a global movement. And I'm always hesitant as an American is to, to wax <laughs> about uh, transnational trends uh, with, with too much authority. Um, I think one of the one of the the things that's really interesting about African American uh, Afrofuturists is that they are very concerned about Africa, right? You can see this in in the work itself. I mean a lot of early uh, really throughout Afrofuturism um, as a sort of like genre in, in literary genre, but you know, also in, 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 in sort of like visual, like the aesthetics of it, there is a constant engagement with Africa, right? And this, and this goes to this idea of recovery that's very important to uh, um, African-Americans uh, related to what they're, what they're looking for from an Afrofuturist practice, right? Like they sort of lost some level, lost a connection to to their, their, their heritage. And this idea of recovery is in part about recovering an understanding of like their African roots. There is some, there is some sophistication, and I think uh, com complication related to, uh, for instance, someone like Nadia Korafor, who says she doesn't do Afrofuturism, she does uh, a, a, a different thing, right? And, and I, I totally understand that because she's, she's arguing not unreasonably that a, a whole set of cultural motivations related to her um, Nigerian heritage are influencing how she might be thinking about the future, right? Uh, even though her Binti short stories are, Binti short stories series are very much associated with Afrofuturism for a lot of readers, um, you can just Google her name and see her like talking about like I don't do Afrofuturism as it's sort of described, right? And and that actually makes it a certain kind of sense. And I think a lot of Afrofuturist theorists and scholars would argue that Afrofuturism has matured enough as a field that the peculiarities or the sort of like tools associated with Afrofuturism do reflect the sort of experiences as Ronaldo Anderson talks about, like Afrofuturism sort of respects the experiences, reflects the experiences of people on the ground dealing with problems that they're facing, right? So it should not be shocking to us that someone who's an Afrofuturist in um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, is gonna have a different set of like 
ways to think about things than someone in Detroit. But they're still Afrofuturists, right? You can still see them sort of like in the same landscape, right? Or someone in Berlin, right? Like they, they can still be Afrofuturists. And they can sort of recognize each other as Afrofuturists and talk about what they're doing, right? And that's the other thing because it is a sort of digital, we, are, we live in a sort of like social media, digital driven world. Um, it's very easy for Afrofuturists in Africa and Afrofuturists in America and Afrofuturists in Europe and Afrofuturists in South America to be in conversation with each other. But um, I would say that's really, 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 really important um, for us to recognize the, the circumstances on the ground, how important those are for how people are formulating their visions of freedom. Okay, well, uh, thank you so much. It doesn't look like we have any more questions, but we thank all of you for attending today and being part of this. Uh, the exhibition is open on the MSU Museum website if you'd like to check that out. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again on April 7th for our next talk. But thank you so much for joining us.